WB has created so many moments that it's reasonable to expect some of them to not age that well. These moments though are just disturbing, especially number one. At 2008 Survivor Series pay-per-view, one of the main matches on the card was a triple threat match for the WWE Championship. Originally, it was to feature Triple H, Vladimir Kozlov, and Jeff Hardy. However, things changed at the last minute. At about 3am, the night before the show, it was reported by WWE themselves that Jeff Hardy had been found unconscious in a stairwell at the hotel he was staying at and had been rushed to the hospital. It was written by the company like it was a real news story, which is interesting since WWE usually tries to ignore incidents like this. Many prominent media outlets realized the gravity of the situation and they reported on it as well. TMZ investigated the story and called all the hospitals in the city looking for an update on Hardy, but they couldn't find anything on him and it was soon revealed that it was a made up storyline. Even at the time, this could have been seen in bad taste since Jeff Hardy had issues with drugs and alcohol. Over a decade later though, it's even more disturbing considering Jeff Hardy's intoxicated performance in 2011 and even his most recent public intoxication in 2019. There's no doubt that Paul Bearer makes everyone's list of the greatest wrestling managers ever. He's managed some of the most iconic wrestlers of all time, but looking back at Bearer's career is a bit disturbing nowadays. In 2004, Paul Bearer and The Undertaker reunited. They began a feud with Paul Heyman and the Dudley Boys who kidnapped Bearer. At the Great American Bash, Taker faced the Dudleys in a handicap match to save his manager from being mixed into concrete. The dead man did win, but had a change of plans. Instead of saving Paul Bearer, The Undertaker decided to pull the trigger himself and let Paul suffocate to death inside a tank of concrete. With Paul Bearer's real life passing in 2013, it's a little eerie rewatching a moment like this. It doesn't help either that six years later, Kane would push Paul Bearer off a high ledge and in 2012, he locked him in a freezer. During his run in the Attitude Era, Big Boss then feuded with all of Vince McMahon's enemies, one of whom was The Undertaker. The rivalry ended with a fight inside Hell in a Cell at WrestleMania 15. The match wasn't anything special, but the ending is something everyone remembers. With help from the Brood, Undertaker put a noose around Bossman's neck, with Paul Bearer causing the cell to rise. Bossman looked lifeless, and while he would return, it appeared as if the Undertaker killed him. Five years later, Big Bossman passed away at the age of 41 due to a heart attack. It's unsettling to see Bossman's body hung after his death, especially due to his young age. Brian Pillman is one of the coolest wrestlers ever, and one that never achieved his full potential. In 1996, Pillman was playing a loose cannon character and was feuding with his former friend, Stone Cold Steve Austin. This led to the infamous moment where Stone Cold invaded Brian Pillman's home, and while that was disturbing both then and now, there's something else that makes this moment darker today. Before Steve Austin came storming in, Pillman made this comment. Look Kelly, I'm alive and well. I got excellent prognosis for 97. Almost exactly 11 months after saying this, Brian Pillman would die from a heart attack at the age of 35. The Ultimate Warriors return to WWE in 2014 was something fans never thought would happen due to the bad blood between Warrior and the company. This made it an even more inspiring moment when Warrior spoke on the Raw after WrestleMania 30. Every man's heart one day beats its final beat. His lungs breathe their final breath. And if what that man did in his life makes the blood pulse through the body of others, then his essence will be immortalized. It was a great moment, but quickly became eerie. Two days after saying this, Ultimate Warrior would die of a heart attack. Listening to his speech after his passing, it sounds as if Warrior predicted his own death. On Monday, June 25th, 2007, it was discovered that Chris Benoit, as well as his wife and son, were all dead. In response, WWE turned Raw into a tribute to Benoit. Of course, it was soon discovered that the Benoit tragedy was a murder-suicide, so the entire tribute show is weird to watch today, but there's one moment in particular that stands out. Various wrestlers were given the opportunity to share their thoughts and feelings about Chris Benoit. One of them was William Regal, and listen to what he says. At a later date, I'll be quite happy to sit here and tell you all the things about Chris Benoit that I'd like to tell you. Um, William Regal looks uncomfortable, as if he was aware of something that no one else knew. 
Now we're getting to the really deep end. At ECW One Night Stand in 2005, one of the wrestlers appearing on the show was Mike Awesome. From the moment he came out, Awesome was booed by the crowd. This is because Mike Awesome had abruptly left ECW in 2000 to jump ship to the bigger company, WCW. To be fair, ECW did apparently owe Mike Awesome money, which is why he left. Regardless, fans and commentator Joey Styles were still mad at Mike Awesome for what he did five years earlier. Awesome didn't let the negativity get to him, and he and his opponent, Masato Tanaka, put on an amazing match. During the fight, Awesome hit a suicide dive, prompting Styles to say this. Suicide dive by Mike Awesome, and it's a shame he didn't succeed in taking his own life. While it was a little harsh even back then, this moment became much darker a couple of years later. In 2007, Mike Awesome would commit suicide, killing himself at the age of 42. I'm sure Joey Styles didn't seriously mean it, but that doesn't stop what he said from being pretty disturbing. In 1999, The Rock and Mick Foley had their acclaimed I Quit match. The two fought all over the arena, and saying it was a painful match would be an understatement. But it all pales in comparison to when Rock cuffed Foley's hands behind his back, grabbed a steel chair, and repeatedly hit Foley in the head. In total, the Great One hit Mick Foley with 11 unprotected chair shots. To understand how serious this is, today WWE has completely banned chair shots to the head. It was hard to watch back then, but knowing what we know now about the long term damage this stuff has to the brain makes this match several times more disturbing. What makes this even worse is that Mick complained that Rock didn't apologize to him. However, Rock says that he did, but Mick just doesn't remember. One of Eddie Guerrero's greatest feuds was his heated rivalry with JBL. The two battled it out for the WWE Championship not long after Guerrero won the title in 2004. One of their battles came in the form of a six-man tag team match on SmackDown that also involved the Dudley Boys, RVD, and Rey Mysterio. After fighting for a while, Eddie collapsed in the ring. Even though this is all part of the script, WWE still had JBL break character and act like it was real. The reason for this was to give Guerrero some time off, since he was legitimately weakened due to the blood loss at Judgment Day a few nights earlier. In the storyline, this is also the reason why Eddie collapsed during the match. However, knowing that Eddie would pass about a year later from a real heart attack makes this difficult to rewatch. For this last one, rather than me explaining it, why don't I just show you? Monday night, my wife and my children will not be watching Raw because I am going to do something that is unthinkable. I'm going to leave you with my anger. Sleep well. Do I really need to say anything? Knowing what Chris Benoit did in 2007, this almost seems like a real warning he's giving, but here's the context. This video is from 2004. At the time, Benoit and Edge were the World Tag Team Champions. During a match on Raw, the Radar Superstar turned on Benoit and cost them the titles. Afterward, Edge attacked Chris Benoit and busted up Benoit's head, which is why he's bleeding. This set up a one-on-one -on -one match between the two for next week, and that's what Chris is referring to in that video. The reason why Benoit is saying his family isn't going to be watching Raw is because his match with Edge is going to be so violent. Even with the context, it's still incredibly unsettling to watch this video of Benoit knowing what he did. While you can see that video, there are other WWE videos you aren't allowed to watch, but you probably wouldn't want to anyways. Hit the annotation on the screen to find out more.